Alter Accounts by Serena Nanda and Richard L. Morris. Chapter 3 Doing Cultural Anthropology Working Among Young Offenders in Brazil. Doing fieldwork is a fundamental part of anthropology, but is often a deeply challenging experience as well. Kristen Drybread set off to study adults who work with at risk youth in northeastern Brazil but soon found herself working with juvenile male prisoners. Her work brought her into conflict with prison officials and other local elites, but brought rich rewards and rapport with her young research subjects. First issue, Drybread confronted with that elites and prison administrators did not understand the techniques of anthropology. Although they were well acquainted with survey research and brief fact-finding missions, they had no experience. The patient long-term daily involvement that doing cultural anthropology requires. Neither they understood it as doing research nor respected it. In time, their disrespect would turn into outright hostility. She found this surprising in light with her desire to portray her subject in an honest and sympathetic manner. Drybird soon found out that although the guards used both physical and verbal abuse against the boys, it was the prisoners' codes of honor respect and silence that determine the status and security of each inmate. Rebellions, fights, even murders were common means of social control within the prison. Prisoners rebelled to exact vengeance against the informers to scare the guards and administrators and because they were bored. The inmates' boredom made Drybread's job easier. Talking with her provided novelty and distraction and they were often glad to do it. She was helped by two fortuitous events. Just on a preliminary visit to the prison, she accidentally left a pen in the hands of a prisoner. In a prison, a pen can be a lethal weapon, and Drybread had mistakenly broken an important prison hole by leaving it. However, it helped her build her credibility among the prisoners. In a second incident that happened outside the prison, Drybread had an incident that left her hospitalized with a three-inch knife wound. The inmates assumed she had received the wound through violent confrontation that she had shown herself strong enough and smart enough to survive. This false assumption gave her legitimacy among the prisoners. Early in her research, Drybread was given a small office and prison officials requested that she interview her patients there. However, after her knife wound, the administration increasingly treated her like a prisoner. She stayed outside in the prison yard, shared the prisoners' food, and witnessed their frequently illegal activities, including drug deals, prostitution, and the hatching of escape plans. Dried bread was constantly tested by the prisoners. They made sure she saw relatively minor crimes to see if she would report them to the guards. When she did not, she earned the reputation as a person who could be trusted. She also built trust by bringing her bag into the prison yard and allowing the boys to examine it, something no one else did. Dried bread let it be known that she could not witness violence without reporting it. As a result, even though the prison had a reputation of one of the most violent juvenile detention centers in the nation, and even though violence occurred during the time she was researching the prison, she personally witnessed none of it. Thus, working with the prisoners changed dry bread. Her presence changed the culture of the prison yard, making it less violent while she was present. After nine months of work in the prison yard, Drybread was suddenly forbidden to work there. The administration claimed that the yard was dangerous and that she faced the possibility of violence or rape. Drybread, confident of her own safety, appealed to the judge of the local juvenile court to be allowed to continue to work. To permit her to work, to continue, but gave the prison administrators the right to pose intimate search on her. Thus, she had to face a cavity search each time she wished to enter the prison. The search did nothing to improve her safety, but was a strong technique of intimidation. Reflecting on the events, Drybread noted that after promising the prisoners that she would keep their recorded life and histories private, she had refused the prison psychologists and social workers to assess them. This was her punishment, designed to teach her that going back on promises to respect the privacy of the powerless is much easier than having her own privacy destroyed by those more powerful than her. As Drybread's work continued, the administration's hostility grew. After each cavity search incident, they restricted her to reviewing prisoners in an office and falsely told her that those she wished to interview were either busy or refused to meet her. Eventually, she discovered ways to continue meeting with the prisoners 
but continued to face strong hostility from the administration. She found herself become more hostile and disrespectful of them as well. Tribad writes that her experience changed her ideas about violence. Before she went to Brazil, she believed that violence was never a viable solution to conflict. However, now she is convinced that nonviolence is unlikely to work in Brazil. In Northeast Brazil, murder is used as a tool of power by the rich and poor alike. Murder and blood vengeance are common among the inmates with whom Tribred worked. However, they murdered not out of inverberate criminality, but to seek vengeance and justice. For the powerless in Brazil, violence is a last-ditch attempt to be reckoned with, to be treated with, least a modicum of respect. By the end of her research, Drybread was receiving death threats herself. Her subjects urged her to take them seriously, and she reports that, like them, she has taken to sleeping with one eye open. Drybread's experiences are extreme. Relatively few anthropologists work with violent offenders, and probably even fewer are able to work with active opposition of local officials. However, she faced many problems common to all anthropologists. How to gain access to the people you wish to study. How to establish rapport. The limits of an anthropologist's responsibility to those with whom they work, and other issues as well. If you have any picture of anthropologists at all, you probably think of men and women who share the lives of people who are different from them. Indeed, although anthropologists also work their own cultures, one of the fundamental ways in which anthropologists work is by spending time in other cultures. Psychologists and sociologists may be able to do research without leaving the college campus. They conduct surveys using the telephone, the internet, or the postal service, and they may bring students into a laboratory and ask them questions or observe their reactions. Philosophers and scholars of literature may work by reading, observing, and pondering. Anthropologists do these things too, but in addition, they must go into the field. For more than 100 years, anthropologists have gone into other cultures. They've lived among small, isolated groups that forage for their food, have joined with societies that travel with their herds, and spent time in agricultural villages and bustling modern cities. They've lived among farmers, craftsmen, thieves, and crack cocaine dealers. If you enjoy anthropology, fieldwork is one of the key reasons you're attracted to it. There is something profoundly romantic about the idea of living with members of another culture, learning their way of life, and attempting to understand the world in a new and different manner. However, as Drybread's description of her experience show, there are also challenges, ethical dilemmas, alienation, and sometimes even danger. Fieldwork is a wonderful experience. It is essential to the ways in which anthropology is done. However, it can also be intensely lonely and disturbing. It changes almost anyone who undertakes it, often in ex unexpected ways. In this chapter, we explore some of the history and practice of fieldwork. We examine fieldwork techniques and different trends in the anthropological data collection and discuss some of the ethical issues raised by the practice of anthropology. Anthropology has not always been based around fieldwork. The first scholars who call themselves anthropologists worked in the second half of the 19th century. Among most of the famous of them were Sir Edward Burnett Taylor and Lewis Henry Morgan. Both saw themselves as compilers and analysts of ethnographic accounts rather than as field researchers. They relied largely upon the writings of amateurs, travelers, explorers, missionaries, and colonial officers who had recorded their experiences in remote areas of the world. Because of this, critics of Taylor and Morgan sometimes refer to them as armchair anthropologists. Morgan and Taylor were deeply influenced by the evolutionary theories of their era. They assumed that each such theories would be applied to human society. Thus, they analyzed societies. They used a type of technology and social institutions, such as family and religion, to place each society on an evolutionary scale of increasing complexity. Their scale began with simple, small-scale societies, classified as savages, passed through various chiefdoms, usually classified as barbarians, and ended with societies such as their own, classified as civilization. Although Morgan and Taylor were extremely critical of many aspects of their own society, they were also convinced that they lived in the most highly evolved society that had ever existed. 
There are numerous problems with Morgan and Taylor's evolutionary anthropology. Explorers, colonial officials, and missionaries had particular interests in playing up the most exotic aspects of the societies they described. Doing so increased the fame of the explorers. It made the natives more in need of a good government or salvation that colonial officials and missionaries claimed they could provide. Perhaps more importantly, the evolutionists were so sure that they had properly formulated in a general evolutionary history of society that they twisted and contorted their data to fit their theories. France Boas and American Anthropology The problems implicit with Morgan and Taylor's evolutionary approach led to the radical replacal of evolutionary anthropology at the end of the 19th century. The most important critic of the evolutionism was Franz Boas. Born in Minden, Germany, Boas came to the United States after completing his doctorate in geography and living amongst the Inuit in Baffin Island. In the late 1890s, he became the first professor of anthropology at Columbia University in New York City. From there, he trained many students who became the leading anthropologists of the first half of the 20th century. As a result, Boas' ideas had a profound impact on the development of anthropology in the United States. Boas' studies and his experiences among the Inuit convinced him that evolutionary anthropology was both intellectually flawed and because it treated other people and other societies as inferior to Europeans, morally defective. Boas argued that anthropologists should not be collectors of tales and spinners of theories, but should devote themselves to an objective data collection through fieldwork. Anthropologists must live among the people they study, both observing their activities and collecting stories and information from the most knowledgeable members of the society. They should record as much information about the group's culture as possible. This is particularly important because Boas believed that many of the lifeways of the societies he and his students studied, most often Native American societies, were disappearing. One of Boas's core beliefs was that cultures are products of their own histories. He argued that the cultural standards of beauty and morality, as well as many other aspects of behavior, should be understood only in light of that culture's historical development, because our own ideas are also the products of history. They should not be used as standards to judge other cultures. Evolutionists failed partly because they assumed incorrectly that the most involved cultures are those that have values most similar to their own. In other words, the evolutionists failed to see because their own ethnocentrism. In one sense, ethnocentrism is simply a belief that one's own culture is better than any other. In a deeper sense, it is precisely the application of the historical standards of beauty, worth, and morality developed in one culture to all others. An American tourist who asks, how much is this in real money? When presented a handful of Mexican pesos as being ethnocentric, he or she thinks the money in their own country is real, but that of others is play money. There is nothing uniquely American or Western about ethnocentrism. People all over the world tend to see things from their own culturally patterned point of view. For example, when the people living in Highland, New Guinea first saw European outsiders in the 1930s, they believed them to be ghosts of their ancestors. It was the only way they could initially make sense of what they were seeing. Although most people are ethnocentric, ethnocentrism of the Western societies had had greater consequences than that of smaller, less technology advanced and more geographically isolated peoples. Wealth and military technology had given Westerners the ability to impose their beliefs and practices on others. It may matter little, for example, to the average Frenchman if the Dagon, an ethnic group in Mali, believed their way of life to be superior. The Dagon have little ability to affect events in France. However, French ethnocentrism mattered a great deal to the Dagon. The French colonized Mali and imposed their beliefs and institutions on its people. Some ethnocentrism seems necessary. A group's belief in superiority of its own way of life binds its members together and helps them perpetuate their values. However, to the extent that ethnocentrism prevents building bridges between cultures and leads members of one culture to force their ways of life on another, it is maladaptive. It is but a short step from this kind of ethnocentrism to racism, 
beliefs, actions, and patterns of social organization that exclude individuals and groups from the equal exercise of both human rights and fundamental freedoms. Boas insisted that anthropologists free themselves as much as possible from ethnocentrism and approach each culture on its own terms. This position became to be known as cultural relativism and is one of the hallmarks of anthropology. Boas and his followers maintain that anthropologists must understand and accurately report the logic and dynamics of other cultures. It is important to understand that cultural relativism is not moral relativism. Anthropologists do not argue that all cultural practices are good simply because they are cultural practices. Instead, they argue that all practices need to be understood within their cultural and historical context. Understanding something and approving of it are vastly different. Anthropology pushes us to really understand cultural practices before we critique them. Boas was a tireless campaigner for human rights and justice. He argued that all human beings have equal capacities for culture and that although human actions might be considered morally right or wrong, no culture was more evolved or of greater value than another. He was an unwavering supporter of racial equality. His work and that of his students, notably Ruth Benedict and Margaret Mead, are widely used by Americans who argued for the equality of men and women and for the rights of African Americans, immigrants, and Native Americans. Today, virtually all anthropologists rely on Boas' basic insights. From Haddon to Malowski in England and the Commonwealth. While Boas was forming his ideas in the United States, a separate fieldwork tradition was developing in Britain. In the late 19th century, Alfred Court Haddon mounted two expeditions to the Torres Straits between New Guinea and Australia. Haddon originally was a biologist, but his travels turned his interest into ethnography and the gathering and interpretation of information based on intensive first-hand study. Haddon and his colleagues became professors at Cambridge and the London School of Economics, where they trained the next generation of British Commonwealth anthropologists. Like Boas, their understandings were based in fieldwork, and they made it a basic part of their students' training. Brainslaw Malowski was one of the most prominent students of the Torres Strait scholars. Malowski grew up in Krakow, then a part of Austro-Hungarian Empire, now in Poland. He came to England to study ethnography, and his mentor, Charles Seligman, sent him to do fieldwork on the Trobian Islands in the Torres Straits. Malowski arrived in the Trobians in 1914 as World War I broke out. Because Australia governed the Trobians and Malowski was a subject of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, he was considered an enemy national. As a result, he was unable to leave the islands until the end of the war. Thus, what he intended as a relatively short fieldwork expedition became an extremely long one. Malowski's time on the Trobians was a signal moment in British Commonwealth anthropology. A diary he kept during those years shows that he was frequently lonely, frustrated, and angry. Despite his problems, he revolutionized fieldwork. The Torres Strait scholars had studied culture at a distance, observing and describing it for a short time. Malowski spent years with the native Trobianders, learning their language, their patterns of thought, and their cultural ways. He not only observed the culture, but to an extent, it was possible that he also participated in it, joining in in many Trobian activities. Malowski's style of fieldwork had been came known as participant observation and has become central to the practice of anthropology. Malowski also centered his research on empathetic understandings of native lifeways and on analyzing culture by describing social institutions and showing the cultural and psychological functions they performed. In an era when non-Europeans were often considered incomprehensible and illogical, Malowski forcefully promoted the idea that native cultural ways were logical. For example, in the famous essay on science and magic, he argued that natives used magic only for goals, such as controlling the weather, which they were unable to attain by more rational means. The anthropologies of Malowski and Boas were quite different. Boas and his students focused on understanding cultures with respect to their contexts and histories. Malowski and his students emphasized the notion of function. 
The contribution made by social practices and institutions to the maintenance of stability of society. However, both develop traditions of fieldwork and participant observation. Both traditions have strong histories of opposition to racism. Both see other cultures as fully rational and neither superior nor inferior to Western culture. Despite the great many new approaches in anthropology since the days of Boas and Malaski, their fundamental insights remain basic to the discipline. Anthropological techniques. Today, anthropologists work in a wide variety of settings. They work in universities, for businesses, for government, and for non-governmental organizations. They work on a variety of projects from investigating the relations among kin to researching topics such as shopping behavior and the ways in which people relate to their computers. Because of the multiplicity of anthropologists, it would be impossible to describe all of the different ways that anthropologists go about their work. Therefore, we will focus on the ways in which fieldwork is done in small communities. Most anthropologists begin to do fieldwork as a part of their graduate training and continue fieldwork as a basic element of their careers. Fieldwork is often funded by grants given by universities, government agencies, and nonprofit organizations that promote social science and research. Decisions about which communities anthropologists investigate are based on the factors including personal history, geographical preferences, political stability, cost, physical danger, and connections their professors and other mentors may have. However, the most critical aspect of choosing a location has to do with the particular research questions that anthropologists wish to answer. In the early 20th century, anthropologists studying relatively small groups often attempted to write complete descriptions of societies, their books, with titles such as The Tiwi of North Australia, The Sibe, and The Cheyennes had chapters on subjects such as family, religion, farming, and legal affairs. In a sense, it did not matter much where anthropologists chose to work. Any small-scale community or society could be described. Today, few anthropologists attempt to write such descriptions. This is partly because most feel that their societies are so complex that they cannot be adequately described in a single work. But more importantly, although societies were never really isolated, they are so interconnected today and so changed by these connections that they must be seen as regional and global contexts. Current ethnographies focus on specific situation, individuals, events, and frequently on culture change. For example, recent ethnographies describe the ways in which people in Jamaica use cell phones, the survival techniques of drug addicts on the streets of San Francisco, and sexuality, femininity, and black magic in Brazil. As research is narrowed, both the questions anthropologists ask and the conditions and locations where they can be answered have become more specific. After they have identified an area of interest, Anthropologists spend time reading and existing research on their subject. There is no exaggeration to say that most researchers spend several hours reading each hour they spend doing active research. From their studies, they gain an understanding of the geography, history, and culture of their chosen area. They find out what is known and what remains to be learned about the subjects of their interests. They then try to design projects that help close the gaps in existing knowledge. It is a bit like filling in the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, with one important exception. You can finish the puzzle, but good research leads to more interesting questions, and thus more research. Arriving at a field location can be a disorienting experience. For most people, living in another culture and trying to learn its ways are difficult. Anthropologists are objects of curiosity and sometimes, like Christian drybread in the passage that opens this chapter, hostility. Perhaps more importantly, culture is a learned behavior, and we have been learning our culture since the moment of our births. When we move to a radically different culture, much of that learning is no longer relevant. Anthropologists arriving in new cultures are in many ways like children. Their language skills are often weak, their speech is sometimes babyish, their social skills are underdeveloped, they are ignorant of many aspects of their environment and their new culture. One almost universal result of this situation is the syndrome called culture shock, the feelings of alienation, loneliness, and isolation common to one who has been placed in a new culture.
For graduate students, sometimes the journey stops there. You can be an outstanding scholar, well-versed in literature, and be able to think and write creatively, but unable to do field work. Getting past culture shock is a process of learning the language, customs, and social organization, of gaining the fundamental grounding knowledge that it takes to be an adult in a different culture. Most anthropologists never truly become members of the cultures they study. They are separated from their subjects by their backgrounds, educations, and sometimes by the color of their skin. Anthropologists are also separated by the knowledge that their time in the field is temporary and that they will have to rejoin their other lives. However, in our best moments, anthropologists do come close to acting and feeling like members of the cultures they study. In most cases, anthropologists begin to adapt to new cultures. They develop networks of friends and contacts who guide them in their new surroundings and offer insights into the culture. Traditionally in anthropology, these people are called informants. They may also be called respondents, interlocutors, consultants, and sometimes partners. These terms emphasize the collaborative nature of fieldwork and suggest that the people who do work with anthropologists are active and empowered. Much of what anthropologists know they learned from such people, who frequently become enduring friends. In some cases, anthropologists work with a few individuals whom they believe to be well-informed and eager to talk with them, called key informants. Alternatively, they may construct statistical models and use techniques such as random sampling to choose their consultants. Sometimes they are able to interview all members of a society. Working with consultants is often informal, but anthropologists also use an arsenal of more formal tools, depending on their theoretical interests. Much of anthropology is done by interviewing, using many different techniques. Some anthropologists prepare exhaustive inventories and questionnaires, however, more frequently, they design a series of open-ended questions that allow their subjects to talk freely and extensively on a topic. Sometimes they use interview techniques drawn from ethnoscience and designed to help identify the objects and ideas other consultants think are important. Because kinship structures are important in many societies, anthropologists become adept to gathering genealogical information. Most all anthropologists use informal, unstructured, and semi-structured interviews. Structured interviews are less common. In addition to interviewing, anthropological data gathering includes participating in activities with culture members, mapping, photographing, carefully observing activities, measuring various amounts of production, and occasionally serving apprenticeships. It all depends on the nature of the problem that anthropologists are investigating. For example, an anthropologist studying nutrition may need to observe food gathering and preparation techniques, weigh and measure all food consumed, and analyze it for nutritional value. An anthropologist studying religious ritual would be unlikely to use any of these techniques. As with the techniques used, analysis of data also depends on questions asked and the theoretical perspective of the researcher. Anthropological data generally come from the form of extensive field notes, tape recordings, and photographs. In most cases, organizing data presents substantial challenges. Notes have to be indexed, recordings transcribed, and data entered into spreadsheets. Successful anthropologists often spend more time working with their data than they did collecting it in the first place. Recording an interview may only take an hour or two. Transcribing and indexing that recording may take several days. Ethnographic data and cross-cultural comparisons. Boaz and his students were interested in describing the cultures in their context. Because they understood each culture as a product of its unique history, they did not attempt systematic comparison of one culture to another, and they were not very interested in discovering laws or principles of cultural behavior. However, some comparison has always been implicit in anthropology. For example, one goal of the Boazians was to use their research to cause Europeans and Americans to see their own societies in a new light. British and European anthropologists were more explicitly interested in ethnology, an attempt to find the general principles or laws that govern cultural phenomena. They compared societies in hope of finding such laws and principles. 
Starting in the 1860s, Herbert Spencer began to develop a systemic way of organizing, tabulating, and correlating information on a large number of societies, a project he called Descriptive Sociology. The American scholar William Graham Sumner and his student Albert Keller and Keller's student George Murdoch brought this idea to the United States. In the late 1930s, Murdoch and Keller created a large indexed ethnographic database at Yale University, first called the Cross-Cultural Survey. In the late 1940s, the project was expanded and the name changed to the Human Relations Area Files. The Human Relations Area Files is an attempt to facilitate cross-cultural analysis. It provides a single index to ethnographic reports and other source on 710 numbered subject categories. Some examples of categories are 294 techniques of clothing manufacture and 628 traditional friendships and rivalries within communities. Using the HRAF, researchers can find information on these and many other topics for a wide range of current and historic societies. The HRAF frequently comes under fire as critics charge that the project takes cultural data out of context and therefore corrupts it. They correctly note that the works index in the HRAF were written from different perspectives for different purposes and in different eras. In consequence, the indexing is often inconsistent and analysis based on it are suspect. Despite these problems, work based on the HRAF is often both interesting and insightful. For example, in the 1950s, the rising divorce rate in the United States was causing alarm. Was divorce truly something new and different, a product of minority? Murdoch used the HRAF to show that most all societies had a form of divorce and that divorce rate in the United States in the 1950s was lower than average. Thus, his use of the HRAF allowed people to think about divorce in comparative contexts. In recent years, the HRAF, now available online, has been used to consider a wide variety of issues, including family violence, patterns of cultural evolution, the relationship between production and beliefs about the afterlife, and patterns of warfare and violence. Changing Directions and Critical Issues in Ethnography In the past several decades, new trends and issues in anthropological research have emerged. These include anthropology and gender, postmodernism, engaged and collaborative anthropology, and issues surrounding studying one's own culture. Anthropology and Gender By the 1960s, the role of fieldwork in anthropology was extremely well established. In addition, the position of women within academic anthropology was relatively good, particularly in comparison with other areas of universities. France Boas trained several female anthropologists who had gone on to become well-known within the discipline. One Margaret Mead had become a household name outside of anthropology as well. Despite this, or perhaps because of it, the political movements of the 1960s, particularly the civil rights movement and the feminist movement, caused anthropologists to begin thinking about gender and their discipline in new ways. Feminists soon discovered that the presidents of some very high profile women within anthropology did little to counteract the fact that the overwhelming majority of anthropologists were men and that their areas of interest intended to focus on the social roles, activities, and beliefs of men in the societies they studied. There were several reasons why anthropologists had focused on men. First, in many societies, men and women live quite segregated lives. Because they were men, most anthropologists had little access to the lives of women. Second, anthropologists tended to assume that men's activities were political and therefore important whereas women's activities were domestic and therefore of less importance. Third, in most societies, men's activities are far more public than women's activities. Anthropologists tend to assume that what was public and visible was more important than what was behind the scenes and less visible. However, this is clearly not always or even often the case. The result of taking men more seriously than women was a systematic bias in anthropological data and understandings. Anthropologists had often reported with great detail and accuracy about immense social and cultural worlds, but they had barely scratched the surface of women's worlds. 
Furthermore, the assumption frequently implicit in ethnographies that men spoke for all society often made cultures appear more harmonious and homogeneous than they actually were. Starting in the 1970s, increasing numbers of women joined university anthropology facilities. By the late 1990s, more than 50% of new anthropology PhDs and more than 40% of all anthropology professors were women. They began paying greater attention into women's lives. By the 2000s, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning people also found an increasing representation on university facilities, leading to the emergence of LGBTQ studies as an academic field. As this happened, anthropologists turned from the study of women to a more general considerations of the nature and role of gender in our own and other societies. We will address these issues more fully in Chapter 9. Postmodernism Ultimately, the issue of gender in anthropology focused on ways of knowing. Feminists argued persuasively that male anthropologists had missed vital dimensions of society because their gender and their academic interest predisposed them to see certain things and not others. These ideas dovetailed well with postmodernism, a critique of both natural and social scientists that gained prominence in the 1980s. Postmodernists hold that all knowledge is influenced by the observer's culture and social position. They claim field workers cannot discover and describe an objective reality because such a thing does not exist, or exists but cannot be discovered or comprehended by human beings. Instead, postmodernists propose that there are many partial truths or cultural constitutions which depend on frame of reference power in history. Postmodernists urged anthropologists to examine the ways they understood both fieldwork and writing. They demanded that anthropology become sensitive to issues of history and power. Some postmodernists challenged the ethnographer's role in interpreting culture, claiming that anthropological ethnographies were just one story about experienced reality, and the ethnographer's voice was the only one of many possible representations. During the 1990s, reflection on the nature of fieldwork and anthropological enterprise became a central focus of writing and anthropology. Works such as Writing Culture and Women Writing Culture encouraged anthropologists to think about the ways in which their own status, goals, and techniques of academic writing shape the work they produced. In many cases, anthropologists turned from writing about culture to writing about anthropology itself, and critical analysis of earlier anthropological literature became common. In other cases, rather than trying to describe culture or find the principles underlying cultural practices, anthropologists wrote about their own experience of living in other cultures. The claims of postmodernists were subject of intense debate in anthropology. Few anthropologists accepted the postmodern critique in its entirety. However, in some ideas of postmodernism have become part of the mainstream. The issues of power and voice, who gets to tell a story, who is believed, have become basic aspects of current anthropology. Most ethnographers spend time reflecting critically on their positions as observers, considering the way their background and interests affect their work and most think far more about the moral and political consequences of their work than they did before the postmodern critique. Engaged in Collaborative Ethnography Engaged in Collaborative Ethnography reflects some of the concerns just noted. Collaboration is a process of working closely with other people and in a sense describes all anthropological research. Collaborative anthropologists highlight this aspect of their work. They consult with their subjects about shaping their studies and writing their reports. They attempt to displace the anthropologist as the sole author representing a group and turning research into a joint process between the researcher and the subject. The work of James Bradley is an important contribution to the collaborative engaged anthropology. His classic ethnography, You Owe Yourself a Drunk, was aimed at getting the public to understand and helped the homeless alcoholics who were subject of the book. Eric Last 
Ister, an anthropologist inspired by Spradley, has done collaborative work with the Kiowa Indians in Oklahoma. The Kiowa are particularly interested in an ethnography of Kiowa song. They stipulated that it to be written so that it could be read and understood by the Kiowa people themselves and that they would be acknowledged for their contributions. Lassiter emphasizes that critical aspect of his collaboration with the Kiowa was to give the highest priority to representing the Kiowa cultural consultants as they wished to be represented, even if this meant adding or changing information or changing his interpretations. For Lassiter, collaborative ethnography was not just eliciting the comments of the cultural consultants, but even more importantly, integrating these comments into the text. Although many anthropologists practice some elements of collaborative anthropology, there are deep problems with the notion that anthropologists' primary job is to write and say what their consultants want. First, most probably would agree that anthropologists have an obligation to accurately report what people actually say and do rather than what people want said of them. Furthermore, communities are rarely homogeneous that they speak with a single voice. Collaborative anthropology may give a voice of legitimacy to one element of the community over another. Often writing what consultants want really means choosing their side in a political context. Using anthropology, a life engaged anthropology. Anthropology has a long history of engagement with the societies that anthropologists study and political activism in an anthropologist's own societies. Franz Boas, for example, wrote and spoke frequently on the major and political issues of his day. He was deeply involved in the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and contributed to its journal, The Crisis. His work was fundamental to the Supreme Court's Brown v. Board of Education decision ending legal segregation. Many other anthropologists have followed Boa's example of engagement. Pauline Weisner has been a working anthropologist since the early 1970s. Though she is trained in archaeology, her interest shifted to working with current-day people during research for her doctoral thesis among the Jew, Huwasni, Bushmen, and Botswana and Namibia. In Botswana, she documented the gift-giving and exchange patterns that tie people together and help them survive in difficult times by giving them broad access to resources. However, Weisner's academic interests soon led to a deeper and more active engagement in the community. As the Jew Huasni lost access to their historic lands and were forced to move from nomadic to sedimentary lifestyles, Weisner became concerned with their ability to feed themselves. She established a nonprofit organization, the Tradition and Transition Fund, to help the Juhwasni protect their water sources and gardens from animals and develop new resources of food. Weisner's development with the Enga of Papua New Guinea has been even more dramatic. She began working with the Enga in the 1980s. As with the Juhwasni, her initial interest was documenting the exchange and patterns of social networks across both space and time. However, by the 1990s, it turned to warfare. The Anga, like many PNG groups, had a long history of warfare. Though these wars were serious, they were fought with bow, arrow, and spear, and the number of people killed was small, usually less than five. This changed in the 1990s, when young Anga men became increasingly impoverished and homeless, but had growing access to weaponry, such as M16 rifles. Previously, small contained wars erupted into large-scale violence that claimed hundreds of lives and turned large areas of Anga territory into wastelands. Weisner's research study has shown that the violence came to an end after more than a decade as a result of three factors. The exhaustion of the majority of the population, the influence of the Christian church that provided an alternative ideology of peace to the Anga ideology of war, and the presence of traditional justice system that could be used to mediate disputes. Weisner used the results of her research to lobby both Anga leaders and local government officials to gain support of the use of traditional justice system. In the past decade, Weisner and the Anga provincial government 
have become increasingly concerned with the rapid loss of Anga culture. The justice system is an area of particular concern. Customary law courts handle 80 to 90 percent of all Anga disputes. If young people do not know the customs, principles, and values of their own society, these courts will struggle. Beginning in 2005, Wisner used her funds along with the money she and her Anga colleagues raised to open the Anga Take Anda, a community center and museum located in the capital of the Anga province that both preserves Anga culture and presides a neutral place where members of different groups could come together. More recently, with the support of the Anga provincial government, Wisner has developed a curriculum for schools, grades 6 to 12, which integrates culture into every subject and encourages students to do cultural research in their own communities. Starting in 2017, cultural education will be taught in all Anga schools. Studying one's own society. When most people think of anthropologists, they imagine researchers who study others in exotic locations. But since the early 20th century, anthropologists have also studied their own societies. W. Lloyd Warner, Salone T. Kimball, Margaret Mead, Zora Neale Hurston, and Hortense Powdermaker were all American anthropologists who wrote about American culture. Kenyan anthropologist, as well as freedom fighter and first president of Kenya, Juma Kenyatta wrote about the Gikuyu of Kenya in 1936, and Chinese anthropologist Francis Xu wrote extensively on the Chinese society. In recent years, writing about one's own culture has become even more common. This trend is driven by many factors, including the training of more anthropologists from more different cultures, the increasing total number of anthropologists, and the rise of interest in ethnicity in the United States and Europe, as well as the dangers of violence in some areas where anthropologists have studied in the past. The emphasis on more reflective fieldwork and ethnography affects all anthropologists, but particularly those who study their own societies. Traditionally, anthropologists doing fieldwork try hard to learn the culture of the people with whom they are working. In a sense, anthropologists working with their own culture have the opposite problem. They must attempt to see their culture as an outsider might. This is challenging because it's easy to take cultural knowledge for granted. In addition, it may be difficult to maintain a neutral stand in one's old culture as it is in a different one. As Margaret Mead once noted, it may be easier to remain culturally relativistic when we confront patterns such as cannibalism or infanticide in other cultures than when we confront problematic situations such as child neglect, corporate greed, or armed conflict in our own. Some of the problems and rewards of studying one's own culture can be seen in Barbara Mirhoff's books and films. Mirhoff contrasted her work with the Huichol of northern Mexico with her work among the elderly Jewish people in California. She notes that in the first case, doing anthropology was an act of imagination as a means for discovering what one is not and will never be. In the second case, fieldwork was a glimpse into her possible future, as she knew that someday she would be a little old Jewish lady. Her work was a personal way to understand that condition and to contemplate her own future. Tragically, it was a future that never arrived. Mirnoff died of cancer when she was only 49. More recently, Darren Ranko, an anthropologist and member of the Penobscot American Indian Nation, has considered the problems and issues Native anthropologists face. Ranko notes that in his earliest anthropological projects, he had trouble trying to do work that seemed anthropological to him and at the same time treat his family and friends in respectful ways. For Ranko, one way out of this dilemma was trying to do work that the Penobscots themselves would find interesting and important. He decided that the criteria for such work included empowering people, involving members of the community, making finished products of research available to community, and focusing on the research that provides direct benefits to the community. Ranko writes that when he considers a project, he asks himself how the project will endorse, elaborate, or enhance tribal sovereignty. 
He will not undertake the research if he cannot answer the question. We can all empathize with Ranko's desire to benefit our own community. However, we can also see the complications it may create. How can one be sure of the outcome of a project at its beginning? What should anthropologists do if a project results turn out not to enhance tribal sovereignty? Should any anthropologist refrain from asking questions for fear that the answer might be displeasing? Is enhanced tribal sovereignty always beneficial to the members of the Penobscot Nation? Anthropologists should certainly investigate groups to which they belong and may indeed have particularly useful insights into those groups. However, the very concept of native anthropologists is problematic. Groups are almost never homogeneous, and individuals have many identities. Being a native in one identity does not make one a native in all one's identities. Ethical considerations in fieldwork. As questions about native anthropologists show, ethical issues frequently arise in anthropological research. Anthropologists have obligations to the standards of their discipline, to their sponsors, to their own, and to their host governments, and to the public. However, first ethical obligations are usually to people they study and to the people with whom they work. These obligations can supersede the goal of seeking new knowledge. According to the American Anthropological Association Code of Ethics, anthropological researchers must ensure that they do not harm the safety, dignity, or privacy of people with whom they work. This includes safeguarding the rights, interests, and sensitivities of those studied, explaining the aims of the investigation as clearly as possible to the people involved, respecting anonymity of informants, not exploiting individual informants for personal gain, and giving fair return for all services. It also includes the responsibility to communicate the results of the research to the individuals and groups likely to be affected, as well as to the general public. Informed consent is a critical aspect of anthropological ethics. Generally, this requires anthropologists to take a part in an ongoing discussion with their consultants about the nature of the study, as well as the risks and the benefits of their participation in it. In particularly, informed consent means that the study participants should understand the ways in which release of research data are likely to affect them and that they must be free to decide whether or not they will participate in the study. And if they begin to participate, they must always be free to stop. Anthropologists also have obligations to the discipline of anthropology. Two of these obligations seem particularly important. First, anthropologists should conduct themselves in ways that do not endanger the research prospects or lives of other anthropologists. Anthropologists who violate the mores and ethics of the communities where they work make it unlikely that those communities will accept other anthropologists in the future. Anthropologists who become involved with and identified with governments, military forces, or political platforms may endanger not only their own safety, but also the work and the lives of others. People may come to believe that because of some anthropologists are identified with specific political actors, all are. Most anthropologists also believe that the primary purpose of research is to add to the general store of anthropological knowledge. Thus, they have an obligation to publish their findings in forms that are available to other anthropologists and to the general public. Publishing usually involves review of the work by other anthropologists to help ensure the validity and the quality of the research. Anthropologists acknowledge that certain forms of secrecy are acceptable and on occasion even required. For example, to protect both the communities where they work and the individuals with whom they work, anthropologists may decide not to reveal the precise location of their research or the actual names of the individuals they discuss. However, research in which the methods and findings our secret is a far greater problem. Not only does such research not contribute to the general anthropological knowledge, but the scientific community also has no way of assessing its validity. The obligations to protect other anthropologists and to publish research findings both pose dilemmas. The engaged anthropologists described in this chapter believe that anthropologists must work for the communities they study. However, this may make it impossible for future anthropologists to work at all.
Governments may not grant anthropologists research visas and organizations may not allow research if they believe anthropologists will promote political action against them. For example, Christian Drybread's work described in the opening of this chapter is fascinating and important. However, it is hard to believe that officials at the prison where she worked would ever allow another anthropologist at the door. Applied Anthropologists Who Wish to Work for Businesses and Governments Often, anthropological findings have greatest value for these entities when they are not shared with other businesses or the general public. There may be few jobs available for applied anthropologists who insist on the right to publish the results of their research. Numerous projects have tested the boundaries of ethics and anthropology, both with regard to the people anthropologists study and to the discipline itself. One early example was Project Camelot in the mid-1960s attempt by the U.S. Army and the Department of the Defense to enlist anthropologists and other social scientists in achieving American foreign policy goals. Project Camelot's purpose was to create a model for predicting civil wars, but it was also implicated with fighting insurgency movements and propping up friendly governments. When Project Camelot was made public in 1965, the United States had recently invaded the Dominican Republic and was escalating the war in Vietnam. Project Camelot created controversy both inside and outside of anthropology. In countries where anthropologists work, people began to see them as spies whose presence presaged a U.S. invasion. At the American Anthropological Association, Project Camelot led to a vitriolic debate where members raised concerns for the integrity of research, the safety of anthropologists in the field, and the purposes to which anthropological knowledge must be put. These concerns eventually led to the issuing of the first official statement on anthropological ethics in 1971. Anthropology in the Military In the past decade, concerns similar to those raised by Project Camelot have reemerged over the engagement of some anthropologists in the U.S. military. Anthropologists have worked at military colleges and bases providing anthropological training for officers or analyses of the culture of military itself. They and other social scientists have also worked on the ground collecting data in zones of active conflict as part of a program called the Human Terrain System. Between early 2007 and September 2014, the Pentagon employed HTS teams to help its combat brigades. According to some, the program achieved early success. For example, the obituary of Michael Batia, an HTS member killed in active duty in 2008, reports that his work helped save the lives of both U.S. soldiers and Afghan civilians. However, the use of anthropologists in such circumstances is extremely problematic. It is indeed difficult to see how many of anthropologists' ethical requirements can be met under conditions of warfare. How, for example, are participants to give coercion-free consent while being subject to military occupation? How can anthropologists honestly inform participants about the ways the research data will be used and are likely to affect them? Are individuals in conflict ever really free to decide whether or not they will participate in a study? Can anthropologists working under such circumstances ensure, within reason, that the information they supply will not harm the safety, dignity, or privacy of the people with whom they work? Isn't the point of their work sometimes just the opposite of that? What about an anthropologist's obligation to publish their research? Aren't the results of this sort of research necessarily secret? Historically, anthropologists have been concerned with protecting the rights and safety of the people they study. The primary concern of anthropologists working in HTS must be the safety, security, and goals of their employers instead. Given all the problems with programs such as HTS, it is probably safe to say that a majority of anthropologists oppose this use of anthropology. In fact, the American Anthropological Association has issued an official statement disapproving of it. Ultimately, ethical behavior is the responsibility of each individual anthropologist. The members of the AAA are supposed to subscribe to its code of ethics. Universities and some other research organizations have institutional review boards 
that examine all research involving human subjects for ethical violations. However, not all anthropologists are subject to AAA or IRBs. Lawyers who behave unethically can be disbarred. Doctors can have their medical licenses revoked. In both cases, they violate laws and can be punished if they continue to practice. There is no comparable sanction for anthropologists, and indeed for members of most disciplines. Therefore, there will always be a great diversity of anthropological practice. New Roles for Ethnographers Although there have been native anthropologists for a long time, until the 1970s, the prevailing model of fieldwork was a European or North American ethnographer visiting a relatively isolated and bounded society and then reporting on that society to other Europeans and North Americans. In some cases, anthropologists may have overstated the degree to which societies they've studied were isolated. Societies have always been connected with each other. However, in the past several decades, expensive communication, relatively cheap airfare, and immigration have greatly increased the scale of these connections. Whether they work in cities, villages, or with tribal groups, anthropologists nowadays have to take regional and global connections to account. Research may mean following consultants from villages to their workplaces and cities, collecting genealogies that spread over countries or even continents, and following cash and information flows around the world. In addition to expanding their research site, contemporary ethnographers must often use techniques such as questionnaires, social surveys, archival material, government documents, and court records in addition to participant observation. The deep connections among cultures and the global movement of individuals mean that we must consistently reevaluate the nature of cultures we are studying, their geographical spread, their economic and political position, and their relation to one another. Today, not only are native anthropologists much more common, but the people anthropologists study also generally have far greater knowledge of the world than they did in earlier times. They are likely to understand what anthropology is and what anthropologists do, something not true in the past. In some cases, this has led to difficulties as people struggle over the question of who has the right to speak for a group. In other cases, people from the groups that anthropologists have described have publicly taken issue with their analysis. For example, in the early 2000s, a fierce controversy broke out over the anthropological descriptions of the Yanomamo, an often studied Amazonian group. Had their primary ethnographer, Napoleon Chagon, betrayed them accurately? Was the research team that he was a part of responsible for spreading disease and disseminating the Yanomamo villages? Anthropologists, journalists, and the Yanomamo tribe members debated these questions at meetings and for the popular press. Despite controversies, for the most part, natives' increased knowledge of the outside world has resulted in closer relations among anthropologists and the people they study, as well as more accurate ethnography. Ethnographic data are often useful to a society. Sometimes they serve as the basis for the revitalization of cultural identities that have been nearly effaced by Western impact. Sometimes they play important roles in establishing group claims to authenticity and are useful in political and economic context. For example, when Kathleen Adams carried out her fieldwork among the Taroja of Sulawesi, Indonesia, she became a featured event on tourist itineraries in the region. Taruja tour guides led their groups to the home of her host, both validating his importance to the village and bolstering the tourist experience of the Taruja as a group sufficiently authentic and important to be studied by anthropologists. In the past, anthropologists sometimes worried about their subject disappearing. They argued that the main thing anthropology was designed to study was small-scale, relatively isolated, primitive societies. They worried that, as economic development spread around the world, such societies would go out of existence and anthropology would essentially be done. In a small sense, they were right, but in a larger sense, they were wrong. Any anthropologist today looking to study in society untouched by the outside world would be out of luck. No such societies have existed for a long time. 
On the other hand, the forces of globalization have been as productive of diversity as they have been of homogeneity. Economic, political, and social forces bring groups of people together in new ways, in conflict and in cooperation. New cultural forms are created and old ones modified. Human cultural diversity, imagination, and adaptivity show no signs of dying out. So anthropologists will always have material to study. Wherever human cultures exist and however they change, anthropologists will be there, devising means to study, understand, and think about them.